All right, so we're going to make a start. Thank you very much to everyone who's uh, come along, both here um, in Rocky and spread all around Australia. Um, so we're pretty much going to jump straight into it. Rather than me talking, I'm going to talk for a little bit, but then I'm going to open the floor up to questions. So right at the very end, if you've got any questions at all, um, absolutely anything at all, please um, save them to the end, and we'll, we'll um, try and do a Q&A at the end. All right, so we're going to make a start. So the title of my talk today is uh, Don't Teach Robotics, But Use Robotics to Teach. So just um, before we get jumping into that um, content, for those of you who don't know me, um, I've got a bachelor of um, electrical engineering, I've got a PhD in human order, but for probably the last 10 years, I've been concentrating predominantly on engineering education, how to get more kids involved in science and technology. Um, I started Just running all the... try and uh, fix the microphone because we can barely hear. As you move around, it's rust. Better. Is that better? Can people hear me now? Uh, yes. A little better, but not perfect. You might be better off just using the room mic. It was really clear earlier on the room mic rather than the radio mic. Okay. Room mic. How's that? Is that better? Much better. Excellent. Yeah, good. Uh, so, yeah, so very quickly, I've been running workshops not only for kids, but for teachers, for educators, for people that do curriculum development, all based around how do we get more kids involved in science and technology. Science and technology is a lot of fun. Kids love it, they are really engaged by it, but unless we have the resources in schools to do it, it's not going to see that uptake in an educational environment. Teachers nowadays have their curriculum so jam-packed that there is no time to do stuff because it's fun. We can't do this because it's kind of cool. Everything we do in class has to meet requirements, and teachers at the moment have time about everything that we do. We need to show them how that fits into their curriculum. So I've spent a lot of time um, over the last 10 years and showing them how to actually do that. I am very heavily involved in RoboCup Junior. Um, I've been a former chair of RoboCup Junior Australia. I've been on international committees for RoboCup Junior um, and do a lot of work around that competition space. A little bit about RoboCup Junior in just a moment. Um, I'm also a author of a bunch of different uh, books for teachers. Again, this idea that teachers really struggle to be able to get this stuff in the classroom. If we can come up with resources that we can drop in their lap, and they can use straight away, then that makes their life so much easier. Sorry, Damien, just to interrupt really quick. Yep. Can you, is that other microphone still turned on? Yeah, yeah we can see that happening. Turn it off, I think. Can, they, can you turn it off? Can you turn it off instead of putting it there? Like, hold the button and turn it off? Beautiful. We good? Well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, battery, batteries are out. So hopefully hey, that's you know, good. Thank you. Um, I'm a big believer in community. When I first started doing this 10 years ago, we would often find that in schools you'd have one teacher doing robotics and they felt very isolated. So we came out with um, forums, mailing lists, and try and get more and more teachers talking amongst themselves. Because the best way for a teacher to feel comfortable is knowing that there are other teachers that they can bounce ideas off. Um, just recently, I've been heavily involved with the International Robotics Academy over in Amman, Jordan. So I head over there every year working with their trainers, and their trainers then spread out throughout the Middle East, getting more and more teachers involved. Um, and I'm also uh, quite recently involved with the World Robotics Summit, which is going to piggyback off the 2020 um, Olympic Games and the Japanese government are keen to highlight all Japanese stuff, and so they're going to be running a large robotics um, summit, and part of that will be a competition for students. So that's some of the things that I've been involved with. So a lot of stuff in the robotics field, and a lot of stuff um, particularly in the education side. In terms of RoboCup Junior, this is something I'm very passionate about. I've been doing for over 15 years now. It's a competition that allows kids to take the knowledge that they've picked up, not only in school, but they may have learned themselves, and put together a team to enter in. We've got three different divisions. We've got a dancing robots one, we've got rescue robots, and we've got soccer robots. And so each one of those different divisions have different challenges to it, suit different kinds of kids, and it's a really good way of spreading out um, the kids into trying different uh, bits and pieces. We often find kids will jump between divisions. I'll try a bit of this, try a bit of that, and then go back to the one that they really like. RoboCup Junior is run at many, many levels. So we have regional competitions, state competitions, national competitions, international competitions. 
So kids have the opportunity to not only do something small if they're kind of interested, but if they're really passionate about it, they can take it those next levels and really compete at an international level if they choose. In terms of regional competition, the Central Queensland Regional Competition has been the competition, has the regional competition that has been running the longest. It's been going for 14, nearly 15 years now. And it's been run out of here, um, uh, CQ University, and in particular um, Jason here, who's been coordinating that for the, the last number of years. Very, very good competition. We get lots and lots of teams, and we're starting to see that build up in numbers. Um, we're a very big believer in participation and not competition at this level. Sure, when we get to the national levels, we're sticklers for the rules and make sure we do all that sort of stuff. But at this level, we just want kids to have fun and be exposed to this sort of stuff. We really want kids to be getting their hands dirty with technology. We don't want kids kind of just grabbing something, putting it down and pressing run. We want stuff to go wrong. We want stuff for, um, to go wrong so kids can look at it and try and debug it and fix it as they go along. If you do want any more information on the Central Queensland Robotics Competition, uh, there's a website up there, and we might actually send that out through the mailing list as well. Um, there is lots of good links there, information, what you need to compete. There's tons of tutorials. So as a teacher, if you're going, I really have no idea where to start, we've got that information up there. And there's also information about the mailing list, where we have teachers from the CQ region all in this mailing list. So you, you, again, you don't feel like you're isolated by being only one or two teachers in a classroom. There are lots of other people that are doing similar things to you. So that's just a bit of background about me. Um, the stuff that we're going to talk about, or well, that I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about um, predominantly the technologies curriculum, so the new technologies curriculum that the um, Australian government has brought in, but also to where robotics fits in that curriculum and how we use that, and how we use that as a platform for teaching that uh, technologies curriculum. So as we wander around, we hear these statements. You see it on the news, politicians love to say these sorts of things, they're great attention grabbers, every kid needs to learn how to code. Technology is taking over the world, if we don't prepare our kids, you know, they're really going to suffer. You get a million different sound bites and you hear a mobile app come through, virtual reality. We need to be doing this sort of stuff. So in order to do this, what's happened is that there's been this new curriculum that's been developed, it's called the Technologies Curriculum. The Technologies Curriculum is something that is taught from here to grade 10, where students actually have the chance to play with technology and learn about how technology actually works. This is a little bit different to 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was like, all right, we're doing Microsoft Word, we're doing technology, we're doing computers. And this idea that using technology, it's not the same as understanding technology. Just because I can pull out my phone and open Facebook and you know, flick through, just because I'm using technology, technology does not mean that I actually understand what's happening behind the scenes. So this new technologies curriculum that's coming is really about addressing this idea of getting students to really think about what's happening. The technologies curriculum is a way of thinking, just like history is a way of thinking, geography is a way of thinking. Technologies gives us the opportunity to learn new skills to solve different problems. In terms of that technology um, jargon, using technology is classified as ICT as a general capability. I need to know how to use a word processor so I can write my English assignment. I need to know how to use a spreadsheet so I can graph things in science. So that's using technology. Understanding technology has been really brought about by this new technologies curriculum. So being able to take a problem and break it down and really solve that technology problem. Um, nice little word cloud there. I love these kind of examples of um, visualisation of data. I have gone to the ACARA website and I've grabbed the key elements of the technologies website and popped it into there and they're the kind of words that pop up. The thing to note with this, if you look through that list, this is what the government wants to be teaching our kids. Nowhere in there do you see Microsoft Word. Nowhere in there do you see robotics. Nowhere in there do you see, I don't even think, coding's in there. The technologies curriculum is not about the product. It's not about the content. I don't want to teach coding. That's not what I'm teaching. What I'm teaching is thinking skills, problem solving, problem decomposition, those sorts of things. And the nice thing about that is by learning those processes, it doesn't matter when technology changes. We're all playing with the latest and greatest stuff at the moment. Facebook's all the rage. Ten years from now, there might be something different. And rather than teaching kids those new technologies, 
if we're teaching them the basics about how technology in general works, they'll be able to quickly pick up new things. I don't want to teach Microsoft Word. What I do want to teach is word processing. And that way, when the new word processor comes out, they know what it means to make a word bold. They know what it means to um, align some fonts, those sorts of things. Technology's curriculum is broken down into a couple of different things. So at its very top level, we break it into um, design and technology and digital technologies. And both of those have slightly different focuses. I kind of mush them together and come up with a couple of different things that overall talk about what happens in this technology's curriculum. The technology's curriculum is about a process. So within this process, I like to break it down into those four different areas. Problem identification, problem decomposition, prototyping, evaluation and iteration. Problem identification is really important. Too often, kids just want to make something without understanding why they want to make it. When we're talking about technologies and solving problems, we firstly have to understand what is the problem we're trying to solve. Before I even look at a solution, can I actually articulate what I am trying to solve? Once I get a good idea of what the actual problem is, can I then take that problem and break it down into smaller steps? So this idea of problem decomposition, it's a skill we want to teach the kids. I got this big problem, can I break it into little chunks? If I can break it into little chunks, I can solve those little chunks and then start to put it back together. Once I've got an idea of this problem decomposition, I jump into the prototyping stage. I'm going to build something. I don't care what it is. I'm just going to put it together to try and solve that little problem. Once I've made that prototype, now that prototype might be a physical object. It might be some code. It might be um, a paper that I've written that goes about solving something. But that is some sort of prototype. I then take that prototype and I evaluate it against my problem. So what we want to be teaching our kids as well is this idea of coming up with their own rubrics. What would make a good solution? Can you tell me what would make this really, really good? So this is not me evaluating the students. This is the students evaluating what they have created based on some criteria they've come up with. Because you can't do an iteration, you can't make something better if you don't know why you're making it better or how you're going to make it better. So once they've got this criteria saying, all right, the perfect um, fairground ride must do these three things, they then build their prototype and they evaluate their prototype against those three things that they said were really important. Yes, we meet that criteria. It was awesome. Yes, we meet that criteria. It was awesome. Uh, this criteria we haven't quite met. That then gives them a reason and a purpose to do that iteration, to go through and make a change to it. With all of this stuff, we're not so much worried about the final product. The final product does have some marks associated with it. But what we're looking at is the process. Have the kids understood how to go through that, that cycle going through it all? So when they go through this process, this technologies process, it, it brings up a couple of different things. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, the emphasis here is on the process, not the final outcome. At the end of the day, we don't, if kids are, are building a pencil case, right? I'm not after the world's most amazing pencil case. What I'm after is, have they figured out what the problem is? I've got to hold some pencils. Have they figured out how to break that down into different parts? I've got to look at size, I've got to look at material, I've got to look at different bits and pieces. Have they then done a prototype? I want them to learn about the process, and that way I can throw any problem at them, and they still follow the same process. I don't want them to be the world's best pencil case builder, because if I throw them another problem and all they know how to do is how to build a pencil case, that's not going to help them. But if they know how to solve a problem, how to take a problem, identify it, break it down, and so on, they're going to be much better uh, equipped to deal with those problems. Kids may come up with a rubbish project. It might be absolutely useless. That's okay. Can they tell me why it's useless? Can they tell me exactly where it broke down in 47 different places? Can they tell me in three different steps how they would make it better? Because if they can critically evaluate what they've made, they're better in the better position to then fix it for the next iteration through. Depending on how much time you have, in a classroom, you might be able to make a second iteration, a third iteration, a fourth iteration. But even if you don't get a chance to make a second iteration, you still want your students to be able to critically evaluate what they have made and tell, tell me where it's good, where it meets criteria, where it doesn't meet criteria, and what they would do to improve it. So that's that next part. Can you articulate the steps required to improve it? So even if you don't have time to improve it, can you tell me how you would improve it? Perhaps you can't improve it yourself because you don't have the budget. Perhaps you don't have the expertise at the moment, but you say, oh, I need to learn about this 
um, subject, this subject, and this subject to make it better. But can they articulate that? Because if they can say to me, look, I want to make it better, but I need to know some more maths to make the dynamics of this work, then that shows great maturity on their behalf that they can recognise what they need to learn. And it shows, shows to me that you know, they understand what they will need to go out, what information they need to find. So at the end of the day, the reason why we do all of this is because we want our, teachers, uh, our kids to be able to solve any problem. Like I said before, I don't want the world's best pencil case builder. I want a kid that can take any problem, doesn't matter what I throw at them, they can look at that problem, and if they apply the process of the technology's curriculum, they'll be able to break it down and come up with a good solution. And so that way, when they finish school and go out and do whatever it is, um, they can take those skills. I do a lot of stuff with robotics, but I do not expect that every kid I teach is going to go and become a robotics engineer. It would be nice if they did. But what I really want them to be able to do is the skills they learn while they're doing robotics in this terms of breaking down problems and solving those sorts of things, take those skills into whatever field they go into. So that comes down to now, how do we teach this curriculum? So the technologies curriculum is something that needs to be taught. There are mandated hours, the number of hours per week, depending on your grade level, that you have to be doing technologies. I'm a huge believer in robotics, fills most of those requirements. I'm also um, a firm believer that if robotics does not fit the bill, don't use it. Robotics has a lot of buzzwords around it. There's a lot of people really passionate about it. It does make the news. But at the end of the day, if robotics, if you've got an activity that teaches a topic better than robotics does, does you don't cram robotics in there just because it's all the latest rage. You've got to pick your tool. With all of this stuff, robotics is just the tool. And sometimes it's a good tool, and sometimes it's not a good tool. So we're really, really conscious of this idea of trying to find the right tool. Trap that most teachers fall into is mistaken belief that we have to teach robotics because the school down the road is teaching robotics. We see on the news that they're teaching robotics. The uh, Premier comes out and says every kid is going to learn robotics. However, at the end of the day, we are not teaching robotics. We are using robots as a great platform for teaching the technologies curriculum. It's also great for teaching science. It's also great for teaching maths. But at the end of the day, it's a platform. It's a tool that we're going to use. Just like a pen and paper is a tool we use to be able to teach English or whatever subject we're doing, robotics as a platform, or technology in general, is just a platform for teaching those different uh, um, concepts. But remember, the things that we are teaching are problem identification, problem decomposition, computational thinking. They're the things we're teaching. And in our case, we're going to use robots to do it. So we should be using those robots to teach those different concepts. And like I said before, the reason why we do this is to future-proof the kids. I don't want to teach kids all there is to know about a particular robot base because in five years' time, or well, nowadays, two years' time, that's going to be totally obsolete and there's going to be a new robot that comes in. And I don't want the kids to have to go all the way back to basics to learn that brand new robot thing. If I can take a step back from the robot platform itself and start talking about inputs and outputs and circuits and branching statements and iteration and those sort of concepts, then it doesn't matter what platform I throw at them, they'll be able to pick it up quickly and use that platform to further their knowledge. So what does this look like in a classroom? So there are lots of schools out there that have robotics. A couple of different ways that it's done. So for one, you can use it to teach different subjects. So for example there, I've got up there some maths, teaching maths. Based on some very simple stuff where I've got a robot and I've got a, there's a little polar bear that you can drive up to and a tape measure. Getting your robot to drive from one spot to the other spot. We can come up with a ton of different activities to teach different concepts. And we can pitch it at different levels as well. So I might pitch it at a very low level, grade 3s, grade 4s, grade 5s, just talking about movement from one place to another place. I could talk about directional language, forward, backward, reverse, left and right, those sorts of things. Taking a next step up, I can start talking about circumferences of wheels. If those wheels spin around a certain number of times, how far is the robot going to drive? If it's a really, really hot day and those wheels sag by one millimetre and changes the, the diameter and the circumference of the wheel, how much further are we going to drive now? So some really interesting questions we can start throwing to them. 
Again, next step up, we start talking about position, velocity, acceleration. How fast are you accelerating or decelerating? If I was to map out the position of that robot over time, I can get myself a nice long graph and I look at the slope of the graph and I can start the slope of the graph um, is going to give me the velocity. I can start looking at the torque in the motor. So again, next step up. How much turning force do I have in those motors to be able to drag a weight? What about things like coefficient of friction? How well can I drag a weight across uh, lino or grass or carpet? Can I start getting relative measures between each of those? So all those concepts I pulled out of using robot as a platform. In this case here, it's just a robot driving around. This one here doesn't use any sensors or anything like that. It's a very, very simple set of um, um, instructions required for that robot to drive around. But it uses a robot as a platform to teach those different uh, concepts. The great thing about robots as a platform is that they're really, really engaging. Kids love them. Like, you pick them up, they drive around. Um, I do a lot of stuff with Lego. Lego falls apart, everyone has a laugh, everyone puts it back together again, and off you go. And this idea of having the kids hands-on enjoying what they're doing is, a, is half the battle as a teacher. You want to make your content nice and enjoyable. I can teach all of those subjects there up on a whiteboard with a marker writing out equations, but I lose half the class in the first five minutes. Whereas I can do the same thing with robots, and I hold all their attention. One thing I like to talk a lot about is uh, stealth learning. So with your robots, we don't so much phrase it about, yeah, yeah, we're going to learn about velocity today. What we're doing today is we've got to get our robot to drive as quick as possible to the polar bear without running them over. How are we going to do that? And in doing that, they're going to learn some velocity. They're going to learn some position. They're going to learn some circumference. So what they do is as we're going along, they suddenly realise I need to know more information at this point. So instead of me front-loading at the start of the lesson, all right, you'll need to know this, 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 instead of doing that and then getting very bored, we just start, we jump straight into it. Here's the problem. Off we go. We hit a roadblock because, oh, I don't know how to do that. And at that roadblock, that's the point where we go, now I need to know some information. And kids generally will um, absorb that information a lot more readily if they need to know it. So... It's often called just-in-time learning versus just-in-case learning. Olden days, we had just-in-case learning. I'm going to teach you everything, just in case you need to know it. And, you know, nowadays we do it slightly different, the just-in-time teaching. So we learn, learn, learn. You're going to need this right about now, so I'm going to teach it to you now. I'm going to teach it to you just-in-time so you can use it. And that way the kids absorb it a lot better. So that's an example of using robots as a platform to teach a particular subject. So that one there is in maths. I also love to see this sort of stuff being done as cross-curricular projects. And there's lots of different countries around the world that are now moving towards this idea of cross-curricular um, by taking a single project and drawing from lots of different uh, curriculum areas. So a common one that's often used is we, we need to build a robot for NASA. NASA's put out a tender, they're sending a new robot to, to Venus, and what we need to do is we need to give them an idea of a robot, something that we could send to Venus. As soon as we have that project wrapping around everything, we can then start bringing in different curricula um, areas. So in terms of the technologies, we can take that as a problem, go through our steps, problem identification, problem decomposition, prototyping and evaluation. But we can also start looking at, you know, let's pull in a little bit of history. What's Venus actually like? Let's pull in some science. What are we going to have to deal with when we get to Venus? Um, what kind of material properties are we going to be you know, having to do? What kind of battery sources to, to make this happen? Um, let's throw in some English there as well. One of the things that you know, teach in English is persuasive arguments. We need to convince NASA that our proposal is the best proposal ever. So all the skills we're learning in persuasive arguments, we can then wrap around this cross-curricular one. In terms of maths, there's a ton of maths that I did in that previous slide, but also too, you know, what's the budget going to be? How many pencil cases do I need to sell at the local fair to be able to fund this? That kind of stuff. And getting that maths into the project so the kids can actually understand what's going on and learning those maths as, as they go. All right, so someone's come to me and said, my kids don't care about robots at all, they love horses. You know, everything's about the horses, that's fantastic. So why not create a project around a horse? Using horses, horses as the cross-curricular overall project, let's bring in lots of different platforms to be able to teach that. In terms of the robotic side of it, well, could I build an automated horse stable? One that when the temperature gets too high, the doors open automatically. 
something like that. Perhaps I'm going to RFID all my horses and a GPS unit so I can see where they all are. If I then did some data logging, I see that they all hang around over here. Why do they all hang around here and not over there? Do I need to improve the, the facilities over in this part? So again, we're bringing in all this, this learning, but it's around an activity that is meaningful to the students. It has some context to the students. Um, one of the worst things I've been told about horses is mucking out the stables. So could you build a robot to do that? Um, how big does it have to be? What does it have to move? How do we keep it clean and stop all the stuff getting inside? So again, using a topic they're interested in, can we make it relevant to them while still bringing all these other cross-curricular things? Um, it's interesting to note that over in the Middle East, uh, they've had uh, very big problems in terms of the jockeys that they've had on their camels, often underage children, and the governments over there have recognised this and they're actually implementing robotic jockeys on their camel racing. So they take a robot, plonk it on a camel, and off it goes. So there are other things that you can draw in from those sorts of things. So I, I kind of want to keep harping on this idea that it doesn't matter what you're learning about, we use the robots as a platform in which to do it. So this now gives us the question, well, what do you use? Um, Ten years ago, there was pretty much Lego and nothing else. Nowadays, every three weeks, there's a new product that's come out that this is the latest and greatest thing that you should be using to teach robotics. So just up there, I've got Spheros, I've got Ozobots, I've got Bbots, Mbots, there's a Vex IQ, there's a Lego EV3, there's an Arduino robot there. There are lots of different things out in the marketplace in terms of um, using this stuff in an educational environment. And the, these manufacturers have realised that the education market is big business. So they are really pushing this sort of stuff. So we're seeing more and more of these. With all of this stuff, um, I get asked on a regular basis, which one do I get? And at the end of the day, my overall answer is, it actually doesn't really matter. All of these, like I keep saying, are a platform. What you want to do is take these platforms and can these platforms meet your curriculum requirements? You're not looking for a, a fantastic robot. You're looking for a good platform that solves what you are trying to teach. I have taught with all of those ones and they're all really good and there's another dozen out there that are really good. Beyond this idea that it really doesn't matter, that really doesn't help a teacher who asks me that, um, I kind of broke it down to these different areas here. So when you're looking to get a robotics platform, there's a couple of different things you need to be thinking about. The first one is age appropriateness. We are now seeing, because the technology's curriculum is mandated from prep through to 10, we need to be teaching technologies concepts down to our preps ones and twos. You've got to find a robot platform that will suit their ability level. Let's go back one slide. So top centre there, that little yellow uh, bumblebee is one of my favourites. So that's a B-bot and that suits preps. There's no computer. They don't have to type any code. There's a couple of buttons on top and we can start teaching our kids about directional language, sequential um, instructions, so I could say forward, forward, left, forward, and get that little robot to drive around the maze. So that one there is age appropriate for preps ones, twos, and threes. I wouldn't give that to my grade twelves because it's a really good robot, but it's not good for grade twelves. I'll get bored with it in twenty seconds or less. So you need to really be thinking about what age you're going to be um, wanting to teach to, and the types of robots that'll meet that. Not only is the hardware important, but the software is also important. Depending on which one of these you choose, you may have a graphical programming language. You may have a text-based programming language. There are lots of different types of programming languages, and depending on how old the kids are, you might introduce them at different times. Some of those don't have any programming language, like the B-Bot. It's all done with the buttons on the top. Uh, the one in the bottom right-hand corner, the little blue circle, that's an Arduino. That's a, um, a text-based programming language. That one there is great for grade 11s and 12s because they can handle that complexity. So age appropriateness is the first thing you want to be looking at. Price is incredibly important as well. There are some robots that are incredibly expensive. There are some robots that are incredibly cheap. There's a few out there on the market that they are selling for $20 and $30 each. And you, unfortunately, you get what you pay for. $20 dollars $30, they're not incredibly reliable. There are some good ones, but there are a lot that aren't great. A lot of these robots have been developed by very well-meaning engineers that have put together this fantastic little thing but have not really thought about how it fits into a classroom. There are some great robots. There's a little uh, humanoid robot about, you know, he's about that tall, called Neo. He sets you back around about five, six, seven thousand dollars for one. 
It's a fantastic robot. It looks like a lot of fun. Kids love it. However, for that amount of money, I can outfit a whole classroom with a different style of robot. So you really need to be thinking about where your money is going. Don't buy too cheap, but don't buy too expensive. Availability. What we really want to be doing, especially in a classroom situation, is having stability in terms of our, um, our robots. If something's come out and it's all wow and it's great for three years and that company then disappears or makes something new and doesn't support the old one, you can't buy replacement parts for it, then it becomes very difficult to keep using it in the classroom. So you need to be looking at the longevity of the robot platform. Uh, the good example I use is Lego. So the Lego Mindstorms, their, each of their robot took around about seven years before they introduced the next one. And so that's seven years where a school can maintain a set of robots and get spare parts and maintain consistency. Because you don't want to end up with a classroom that's got 27 different versions of one robot. As a classroom, it's nice to have everything nice and standardised. It's not a problem if you're just buying it for your, for your grandson or you're buying it for your niece or nephew where they're only going to have one. But in a classroom situation, you want to have that stability in terms of the availability of what you're getting. Also, too, in Australia, you've usually got an extra shipping tax because everything is overseas and trying to get it into Australia you have longer lead times and you've got higher prices. Reliability is critical. If you are spending more time just figuring out why it's not working because this bit's not plugged in or that bit's fallen out or this bit's broken, then that's time you could have been spent teaching. And this is where you've got your trade-off with price. You can pay more and get a more reliable thing. You can save a bit more money, buy more robots, but you may spend more time just keeping them going, keep maintaining them. So it's really important to be thinking about that reliability as we go through. Curriculum resources is the big one. No good to have this fantastic robot and you see the YouTube demo and it does a billion different things. And you get it in your classroom and you go, now what? What do I do with this? As teachers, you generally have five or six other subjects you're probably looking after. You don't have time to spend a whole week learning about all this sort of stuff so that you can start writing lesson plans to do it all and get it in your classroom. If you can find a robotic platform that has lesson plans already, even if they are US lesson plans or UK lesson plans, something that you can tailor to your classroom, it's going to give you a head start and it's going to make your life so much easier from a classroom point of view. So you really want to be able to find those kind of curriculum resources. Last one there is teacher support and training. As teachers, again, you don't have time to learn all this sort of stuff. Nowadays, we have great forums and mailing lists to be able to help teachers that run into problems. But as schools, schools need to be investing in their teachers, the professional development of their teachers, and that's not only in English, geography, history, that's also technologies. And teachers need to be able to understand the technology and use it in the classroom. What we're really looking at here is we really want our kids to be able to, to use that technology. And if, as a teacher, you're kind of giving it to them and just shrugging your shoulders completely and going, oh, off you go, you figure it out, then they're not going to get very far. There is nothing wrong for your teacher not to know everything. That doesn't bother me at all, because there's no way you can understand everything that's happening in there. However, as a teacher, you should have enough knowledge to be able to go, oh, I'm not sure how to do that, but I know we can look here, here, and here for some answers. And so you work with your students to be able to do that sort of stuff. So that teacher support and training is really, really important. So ultimately, I tell the teachers, find a platform that you are going to be comfortable teaching. If you're really comfortable teaching this particular platform, that's awesome. If you're comfortable doing it, I know you're actually going to do it. If you really don't like this platform, it doesn't quite sit right with you, you don't have the resources, chances are it's going to be put into a cupboard and put away and never used again. So you want to find some sort of product, you want to find some sort of platform that the teachers will be comfortable doing. All right, we're going to have time. So in kind of a, um, along those lines, you want to be talking with your other teachers in the area, so uh, other teachers in your school. So if you have a bunch of teachers that have to teach technologies, you should really be getting together and saying, all right, what are we going to get? And then figuring out which one of the different platforms are going to suit you best in terms of what you're going to put into a classroom. Everything I've been talking about today so far, especially the second half, has been talking about robots as a platform. I could quite easily change every single word of robot in here for the word coding. Coding is another big thing at the moment, but at the end of the day, we are not teaching coding. We are teaching problem solving skills, technologies, problem decomposition, sorry, problem identification, decomposition, prototyping, 
evaluation. So again, teachers ask me, which programming language should I teach? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. As long as you have a programming language that will teach them branching statements, sequential, um, sequential logic, those sorts of things, any one of those programming languages will work. What you need to do is find a programming language that you as a teacher will be really comfortable with teaching. Because if you're comfortable teaching it, your kids will pick up on it, and the kids will learn a lot more. All right, so that's pretty much what I wanted to say. If anyone needs to get in contact with me, all my details are there. You can just do a Google search for, for Damien Key and my stuff will pop up. I love hearing from teachers all over the place. Um, I travel around a lot running workshops. I've got some workshops coming up in Adelaide um, next week if anyone's interested. I've got Cairns coming up in a couple of weeks' time as well. So if you want to know more about this sort of stuff, if you just want to send me an email and just ask me questions, I'm more than happy to do that as well. Um, I hope today's been really, really helpful for you and you might have picked up a few extra ideas and a few different things you might be able to try in the classroom. What we might do is question and answer. Yep. So we might just go from uh, location to location. So if you have any questions, let's hang on to them for the moment until we get to you. So we might start geographically. Cairns. Any questions in Cairns? Uh, not just yet, thanks, Damien. Okay. No questions in Cairns. Townsville. Uh, any question? Hi, Danny. Uh, your question? question? Uh, uh, no, thank you. No questions? No questions in the council. Mackay? No questions from Mackay. Okay, no questions from Mackay. Um, Rockhampton? No questions at all. <laughs> <laughs> question? Depends on the age level. You want to repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. I'll just repeat the question. So the question is, when we talk about problem identification, how big a problem do we want the kids to be starting with when they identify that problem? And that comes down to age appropriateness. The example was, if I want my rubber to go from one spot to another spot, is that a big enough problem for the kids to then start decomposing? That kind of problem is probably not enough big one. What you want to do is wrap it in a slight context. So instead of saying, I want my rubber to go from here to here, we say, my great-grandma is sick in bed and I want to take her a cup of tea. That is the problem. Once I have that as the problem, I start breaking it down. Oh, I'm going to need my rubber to go from this place to this place. So that's your problem decomposition. Once you have an overall problem, you can then start thinking about the solution. If you start thinking about the problem being the robot needs to go from one place to another place, you're already starting to solve the... You're, you're already starting to suggest the solution. The sol solution... Sorry. The solution is a robot. If the problem is... I need to get my tea from the kitchen to great-grandma, then perhaps I'm going to build a catapult to fling it across. Perhaps I'm going to put it on a little roller coaster to get there. Perhaps I'm going to build a robot to move it across. So in terms of our identification, once we start looking at the different solutions, a robot solution is just one of many different possible ones. Perhaps I'm going to you know, beam it from here to there. And they need to evaluate those different solutions and say that one's not going to work, that one's not going to work. This is a good one to start with. So that, that's probably how I'd see that one. Any other questions in Rockhampton? Yeah. It's kind of... it's yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yep. No, no, you're okay. Yeah. Um, I'm pleased to see if you mentioned there that if it's a given problem, there are many possible solutions, and the best problems are the ones that have all these possible solutions. Yes. If different groups of kids and all come up with slightly different solutions, uh, and that's really empowering. So, so for those people that um, uh, are remotely logged in, so the, the, um, the comment there was that it's really good to see that we're talking about problems having multiple solutions and that we want our kids to identify lots of different solutions. And that comes down to this idea of criteria generation. If I've got a problem, what would be a good solution? Can I list off six different things that would be a really good way of solving this problem? And then looking at those different ones, trying to evaluate which one we're actually going to choose. Well, quick question behind Yep, you want them open-ended. Now, as teachers, this makes our life really, really difficult because I can not just run down and go tick, 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 cross, tick, tick, tick. You have to actually dive into what they've actually made and think a lot more about it. So from a teaching point of view, yeah, we've got a little bit more work on our hands to be able to evaluate each one of these different ones. I hate to see a class where everyone has come up with the same solution. I love to see classes where I've got 37 different solutions 
five of them which work great, five of them which completely fall apart. The ones that fall apart, we look at it, we laugh, we have a great time, and the kids tell me why it fell apart and what they would do to make it better. Um, one thing I often talk about is celebrating failure. When things go wrong, that is not a problem. Things going wrong is a great thing to happen because when things go wrong, you can start asking questions, why did it go wrong and how do we make it better? We want to be able to encourage our kids that it's okay to make mistakes. Um, for too long, we have pushed our kids that they have to get the right answer and they've got to get it first time. They're not allowed to get it wrong. With this one here, I don't care when things go horribly wrong. What I care about is what are you going to do next to make it better? Always looking to make it better. Question? Yeah, so you were talking about finding a platform that is like for you as a school. So how would you go about finding that with your kids at schools that have those robots and stuff there? Yep, definitely ask your friends. Um, ask other people that are around you in terms of what's working for you. Have a look at the different platforms. There are a couple of um, good companies that sell lots of different sorts. So I get all my stuff through Modern Teaching Aids and they've got about three or four, maybe five different types of robot platforms. And you can look at those and start evaluating those ones. If you're looking for the popular ones, so the ones that have lots of good resources, they're things like the Lego Mindstorms, the Vex IQ, um, Dash and Dot, uh, Spheros, Bbots, those are the kind of ones that most schools are taking on at the moment. That being said, there's lots of really cool things coming through. Uh, the Mbot, Mbot is a great little robot that is, uh, you can program with Scratch. So if you're already doing Scratch in school, that your kids already have that knowledge. So there's a lot of these good ones out there. Okay, um, I might uh, continue on uh, down. Um, so any questions from Emerald? No questions. No questions from Emerald. Thank you. Any questions from Gladstone? Yeah, I have trouble inspiring Year Nines, Tens to get into the robotics we've got. Um, they're happy to play Lego, play Lego all day, but actually start programming something and all of a sudden the spark goes out. Um, what do I do about that, Damien? Uh, you've got to find a context that's important to them. If they love horses, you give them a project about horses. If they love computer games, you give them a project where they have to use the platform to solve the problem. If you just start saying, oh, we're doing robots and we're going to learn more complicated programming, then that's where the spirit starts to die out of them. If you say to them, we're going to build something amazing, and they start and they get halfway through and they go, oh, I need to know more, that's when you start feeding them more information. So the way around that is to try and find what they are interested in. Remember, this is not about teaching robotics. It's about using robots as a teaching platform. So if they love something, they love music, build yourself an automated guitar player. And that then gives them the chance to take what they're passionate about and start applying robotics as a platform on top of that. Um, it is tough. I do realise it, it's really hard to, to keep that momentum going, but I find that's the best way. Uh, it makes your life as a teacher very difficult again because you end up with 27 different projects that you've got to kind of manage. But the way to keep that spark is to make sure they can relate it back to something they're interested in. Any other questions from Gladstone? No questions? Okay, Bundaberg. Hi, Damien, can you hear me? Yes. It's Jeff here. Um, I'm from a company called Queensland Computers. We do this equivalent in schools, probably to a lesser degree to what you're doing. Um, just your comments around the cross-curricular uh, projects. The big struggle we find is you mentioned at the start of the lecture that a lot of schools traditionally only had one or two key players in robotics, and we're finding that very much still is the case. When you're doing, particularly in secondary, the cross-curricular projects, it's very difficult to find multiple teachers that will partake in doing that. How are you battling that? All right, so it's tough. And my answer here is that I am running the same sort of roadblocks that you are, in that teachers have their little silo and they don't want to start talking amongst themselves. I'm really lucky that I do a lot of international work and a lot of schools I work with are international baccalaureate schools. And built into the International Baccalaureate is this idea of a global project, which makes it a lot easier. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, you've got to bring the teachers on board. And to bring the teachers on board, you've got to show them what's possible. So I guess it, I, I'd probably recommend starting out small, little cross-curricular projects. And as the teachers start to see the benefit of that, starting to expand it. So yeah, I, I totally feel your pain. Um, Australia is one of the countries where it makes it really hard to do this sort of stuff, but I think we are slowly getting there. It's taking time, but we are slowly getting there. And it'll take teachers like you guys to go through and push that within your schools to actually ask to be able to run these cross-curricular activities. Sorry, I couldn't give you a better answer than that. <laughs> Thanks. And, any other questions in Bundy? 
would you recommend for resources for homeschoolers? Small homeschoolers, um, again, any one of those platforms is fine. You've got to find the one that you're comfortable with. Um, because you're a small homeschooler, you're in a slightly unique situation that you don't have to worry about buying seven of them and maintaining all seven. So you have more flexibility to be able to pick up the ones that you're comfortable with. The Lego is really good because chances are in uh, a lot of kids already have a lot of Lego and so you can augment your robot with some of the Lego that you already own. Perhaps you've got a great spaceship, why don't you add a robot base to it so your spaceship can drive around. They're the kind of things that um, most schools don't have the opportunity to because they don't want kids bringing in their own Lego. Um, so I recommend the Lego, I recommend the B-Bots, um, especially for the younger levels, um, prep one, two, three. And then maybe there's some other Lego products like the Lego We Do, which is great for kind of your three, four, fives, and then the Mindstorms for, for beyond that. But again, find something you're comfortable with, find something that's going to be reliable. Thank you. Any other questions in Bundy? No more questions? Okay, Melbourne. Not sure if that's person in Melbourne. If not, um, Perth, any questions from Perth? No, and I've also got some people connected via Jabba from home. So any questions from um, any of the Jabba people connected? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, Jason, it's Michael Cowling here from Brisbane. Um, my, my, I, I acknowledge Damien's point about the the disconnect that sometimes exists between what the what the MPs say and what the what we actually want to do, and this idea that we're teaching robotics or teaching coding. I'd imagine that sometimes that happens in schools as well, whereas the, where the principal says, "Oh, we're buying twenty of this or thirty of that," and the teachers don't have a lot of say. Uh, I wonder if you've got any advice. I'm, I'm an academic, so that hopefully won't happen to me, but I can see it happening a lot in schools. I'm wondering if you've got any advice from your experience. Um, if you've got, got a principal saying, yeah, we're going to buy 20 robots, then that is not the right approach. The right approach is we need to solve a particular problem. We need to solve teaching our technologies curriculum. What solutions are out there to be able to, to solve that? And if it turns out that buying 20 robots is the right solution, then that's great. If you've got schools that are just buying robots because everyone else is buying robots, then that's not a good way of, again, identifying the problem, breaking the problem down. What you really want to be doing before you even get to the point of we need to buy robots, you need to be thinking about what are we trying to teach? And if what we're trying to teach works best by teaching it using chalk and slate, then you should be out buying 30 lots of chalk and slate because that is the best solution for your problem. So I really push schools that if they say we need to buy robots, that is not what, that's not what they should be doing. They should be taking a step back and saying, what are we trying to teach? Where are the gaps in our curriculum? Where can we make our, our teaching more engaging? If it turns out that robots as a platform is the right way of doing that, then jump ahead and do that sort of stuff. But really try and catch those schools to be thinking about um, what curriculum areas they're, they've got gaps in and how they're going to solve that. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay, that's um, great. Thank you. I might just finish up that I can see that we've got two minutes left of this uh, meeting. So I would like to, on behalf of uh, myself, Jason Bell and CQ University, to thank Damien for coming to give us this lecture. And applause, please. Thank you. Um,